Hello everyone, welcome to the fourth week of uh, Distinguished Lecture Series in Water Security Research of this term 2019. So I would like to welcome you first and welcome our simulcast viewers, in particular our students in China in Beijing Normal University for our massive water security program. And uh, as always, uh, just a reminder, there is going to be Q&A option for our simulcast viewers so just make sure to send me an email with your questions before the end of the talk or during the Q&A and my email is salmon.razavi at usask.ca and I do my best to read them out loud and get some answers from the speaker and uh, yeah and there's a sign up sheet there for our students who are taking this uh, basic as part of their uh, program requirements as always I'd like to thank Jay Familietti Global Institute for Water Security and John Pomeroy Global Water Future Program for underwriting the seminar series and providing logistics and support. This week is great pleasure to welcome Professor David Hanna to Saskatoon. David is a professor of hydrology in the School of Geography, Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Birmingham. He is also the Director of Research in College of Life and Environmental Sciences in the same university and uh, UNESCO Chair in Water Sciences. He did his undergraduate at the University of Aberdeen and his PhD at the University of Birmingham, finished at 1997. And after a one-year postdoc work uh, uh, at the same university, he was appointed as a faculty member in 1998. David is an international expert in water security issues. What I found very interesting about his work is the extent and diversity of his contributions over the past about two decades, uh, so which ranges from core, hardcore hydrology to hydroecology or eco-hydrology. So you might illuminate what you mean exactly when you differentiate the two, or probably they're similar, uh, to basically water management type of research and water policy and supporting decision making. His, also, his work is also very interesting because he kind of covers the full spectrum of scales. So he has work on very small scale uh, from catchment or hill slope type skills to regional scale to global scale. So that's a very wide spectrum and impressive. David has been a major contributor to international scientific community. Other than his UNESCO chair, he has been the UK representative for the International Association of Hydrological Sciences, or IASH, and he's been the vice president of the IASH International Commission for Surface Water for some time. He's been recognized well for his contributions to, the scienti uh, to, to science uh, by multiple awards, uh, including a Thyssen Award from IASH, and more recently he's been elected Royal Society Wolfson Fellow. Congratulations for that prestigious award. <laughs> yeah, so it's great pleasure to have you here, uh, David. So I'll just pass it over to you. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the kind introduction and the fantastic hospitality and this opportunity to speak. So today I'm going to give you an overview of research being conducted by colleagues at the University of Birmingham about water in a changing environment. So understanding how water and environment is changing is a really, really important uh, question for science, one of the key challenges. But it's also very practically important because we have too much water floods, too little water droughts, water that's too hot and so damaging for aquatic or organisms. We have serious consequences for ecosystems and for people in terms of water security. So by way of introduction and to structure this presentation, I'm going to use my own research trajectory uh, f uh, to, to highlight research in three areas. So my research falls within the area of hydroclimatology. So I'm very interested in the links between the climate and water systems and their dynamics. Or put another way, I'm interested in trying to understand hydrological phenomenon and events in their climate context. So I started off working on snow and glacier hydrology, trying to find out how snow and glaciers melt and how water flows through them. I did this in the French Pyrenees and the European Alps. I then moved downstream to consider uh, snow and glaciers in a wider river basin context. 
And I also moved from working in high mountain environments, I started to work at this point in the Himalayas and, and, the, and the Andes, to work in high latitude environments, working in Greenland and in Svalbard. During this time, I was working with ecological colleagues, and these systems are sort of very deterministic in terms of the physical chemical environment influencing the ecology. So I developed a real interest in stream temperature, uh, trying to understand how rivers heat up and cool down because it's so sort of ecologically important. I then had a brief period in the fashion industry, but unfortunately these uh, orange float suits that you use in Svalbard didn't really catch on. So I went back into science and, as uh, someone said, pulled together trying to understand how much of this uh, process hydrology was set in a much wider regional to sort of global context in terms of understanding large-scale climate hydrology interactions, largely within the context of uh, UNESCO's International Hydrology Programme cross-cutting theme, FRIEND, flow regimes from international and experimental network data. I also have a, a cross-cutting interest in what I think is probably termed now as eco-hydrology and the term hydroecology has somewhat disappeared. So two of these award-leading initiatives in hydrology both flag as major research challenges the need to understand uh, how our water cycle is changing and, and why it is changing. So within UNESCO's uh, International Hydrology Programme, which is in its eighth phase, its overarching theme is sort of water security. And here the, the suggestion is we need to identify the, uh, the key patterns and processes that are driving uh, hydrological variability, hydrological change. In parallel, the current uh, International Association of Hydrological Sciences scientific decade, Panta Ray or Everything Flows, is focused on trying to improve our understanding of the interpretation of the processes governing changes in the water cycle. So within this context, the research that we've been doing on water in a changing world tries to address three key areas. The first of which is under trying to quantify and understand changes in hydrological fluxes and stores. So how does water move between uh, the, the different stores, uh, at different rates in different ways? But really importantly, not just to quantify the changes, but to understand why these changes are occurring, to unravel the multiple and synergistic drivers of change. For we know that climate is a first order driver of, sort of hydrological response, but it's modified by river catchment properties and of course increasingly modified by a range of human factors, both directly and indirectly. And lastly, we then need to use this knowledge to reduce uncertainty in make, making projections in space and time. And this really underpins uh, the development of sustainable water policies and uh, adaptation strategies. So that those wide uh, sort, of, uh, sort of challenges link to this sort of underpinning rationale for the UNESCO Chair in Water Sciences at the University of Birmingham, which was created in uh, uh, 2016. So I act as the, the chair holder but actually the UNESCO chair recognizes that the university is a center of excellence and, and sort of innovation uh, in, in the area of hydrological research. There are 50 uh, UNESCO chairs in the, in the water area in the world, 18 UNESCO chairs in the UK, but this is the only one that focuses on sort of water science uh, and the science of hydrology. The research that we do very much links to uh, the current phase of the International Hydrology Program on water scarcity, but also is trying to address the 2030 agenda in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly Sustainable Development Goal 6, which deals with uh, water and sanitation. The chair very much acts as a bridge builder between generating new knowledge, working at the science policy interface, and, and then trying to develop capacity in individuals and institutions through education. So it's a bridge builder between research, education, and uh, society. We work on, uh, uh, on water security at a range of scales, from working with local communities all the way up to working in the context of global s international programs. So I just wanted to, to flag the UNESCO chair and very much welcome uh, you to engage and uh, collaborate with us. So I'm gonna st start off by looking at research on large-scale climate hydrology interactions. And this research is really about trying to understand the interconnectedness of the hydrological cycle at regional to global scales. So the key challenges here relate to our need to increase our sort of understanding or our knowledge of space-time variability. Uh, in this case, I'm focused on sort of river flow dynamics, as river flows have sort of integrated out from, from a basin and this usable water resource. So to understand the, the dynamics, to understand how hydrological cycle is changing, then the next thing we need to do is to uh, quantify the sort of climatic sensitivity of these variabilities in flows to identify both the locations and also the times uh, which mis may be most susceptible to change. And if we do this within a hypothesis testing sort of framework, 
uh, we should be able to increase our understanding of the process cascade from the ocean through the atmosphere, interactions with the land surface to generating sort of runoff and using that knowledge to reduce uncertainty and making projections into the future and for places for which we do not have information. So I'm going to work through each of these challenges uh, in turn. So we've done quite a lot of work on developing methods to detect hydrological change and variability. So these are some data taken from uh, continental uh, Europe, which identify river flow regimes, annual cycles of different magnitudes, going from low to high. And what I just want to highlight here is that you can see with for the orange uh, triangles in 1975 and 1990, these low flows covering a large area of Europe. And then in 1980, which is a year in which there was relatively high flows ac across Europe, the response is much more patchy. And this is related to the generating mechanisms in that uh, low flows tend to be associated with sort of anticyclonic pl blocking systems in Europe, which cover a large geographical domain, whereas high flows are generated by a range of mechanisms from frontal precipitation to convection to snowmelt. But what, what I also wanted to pull out was the importance of understanding regional hydrology, because in all of these plots, we can see that Scandinavia is doing something completely different from the rest of Europe. And the question is why it might, that might be that the case. We've also worked on uh, looking at uh, hydrological variability across large, large domains. In, in this work here, we looked across the northern North Atlantic region. And what we were doing here was we identified for the first time teleconnections or links within the sort of global hydrological cycle between what was happening in sort of Atlantic Canada and, uh, and New England and what was happening in uh, sort of northern Europe. And what we found here was that river flow variability in the autumn in uh, the US and Canada could be a harbinger or a predictor of river flow uh, later in the year in the UK. The question again is why, but it showed this large scale teleconnection, this interconnection within the hydrological cycle. So more recently, we've been working on drought across Europe using sort of observational data. Uh, and we've been comparing two sort of drought indices. One, the standardized precipitation index, which is based just on uh, precipitation. And another uh, measure of drought called the Standardized Precipitation Evaporation Index, which includes both precipitation and uh, an evaporation element, and is, if you like, much more of a water balance measure of drought. What we've got uh, plotted here is uh, patterns of frequency in drought across Europe. And what we could see over the historical period, and I should have said all of what I'm showing so far is based upon uh, observational uh, data sets, we can see that drought uh, in, in Europe, ac across the piece, has increased uh, by an average 20% since the 1960s. But droughts have become more frequent in southern, in southern Europe over this time. What was really interesting was when we compared the standardized precipitation evaporation index, so the, the, the climate water balance based approach, with the uh, precipitation based approach, that from the 1990s, there was a divergence in them. They both showed a sort of increasing trend. But from the 1990s, the standardized precipitation evaporation index really took off. And this is a consequence not just of reduced uh, uh, or changes in precipitation, but actually increased temperatures uh, and, as a result, more frequent droughts. What this sh also showed was that this, the standardized precipitation evaporation index, with these inc increasing patterns, when we hindcast the climate models back in time, showed the cons what, what looks like the consequences of increased anthropogenic sort of global warming within the historical record. So we've done a lot of work on trying to characterize the nature of how the hydrological cycle uh, is changing. But what's really important is to go on and understand why these changes might be occurring. So what we've done is we've worked on a whole range of different sort of climate uh, metrics, climate sort of diagnostics, to see how useful they are in terms of being hydrologically meaningful and, and understanding why the hydrological cycle might be changing. So one of the uh, indices or the approaches that's picked up is, is using these large scale climate diagnostics. And we've got an example here for the UK using something called the uh, North Atlantic Oscillation Index, which is an oscillation of atmospheric mass bet between Iceland and the Azores and drives westerly weather systems across the UK. So other sort of famous cli climate diagnostics to get your mind in, in, in the right frame would be things like ENSO or, or the Pacific Decadal sort of Oscillation. What we can see from this plot is that we had a good relationship between river flow variability and positive phases of the NAO associated with sort of mobile, uh, 
moist and warm of air masses coming across the UK for the north and the west of, of the country, but fairly weak relationships in the south and east. And the reason for this was that catchment properties were driving this, with most of the high sort of elevation sort of capturing the rain in the north and west, and also the most buffered systems with the most permeable geologies duplicating in the, uh, the south and east. So the takeaway message from this is that the climate response is very much modified by catchment properties. But the, these types of indices are, are really pretty coarse. So what we went on to do was to exploit the utility of gridded sort of atmospheric data sets, such as uh, reanalysis products. And here we're using that from the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. And I don't want you to take this detail away from this, but, but the, the message really is that using gridded data, so these were on uh, one to half a degree sort of grids, we found that the centres of action, which are marked out here in terms of these sort of grey areas, varied between the different river basins that we were doing analysis of, of flow variability for, and they also varied between seasons. So providing much more detail on the atmospheric drivers in these course of diagnostics. And indeed, when we looked at sort of correlations, compared to the North Atlantic Oscillation Index, we found that using these gridded data, in this case, which are mean sea level pressure, were much more informative in being able to predict what parts of the atmosphere were having influence on hydrological response, and that varied in space and in time. We've sort of gone even further in terms of linking to sort of more hydrologically meaningful metrics by moving from looking at large scales of pressure patterns which drive uh, how the atmos atmospheric motion to actually looking at water vapour transport in the atmosphere uh, analysing what we might call sort of atmospheric rivers. So what we've got plotted on this uh, side here is uh, the sort of North Atlantic sort of region, the United Kingdom located inside the, the, the box here, and we were looking at a, a, a river system located uh, in the south of England. And we found that for these data, which are plotted for high flow events, that uh, the sort of response or th the high flow events were very much associated with, with fine uh, and sort of quite concentrated vapour transport pathways, jets of moisture coming over the UK. And it was very dependent upon where these intersected with the catchment in terms of whether, uh, whether we had a response or not. We've also ap applied this approach uh, in uh, the Southern Hemisphere, in this case to the South Island of New, New Zealand in the Waitaki River. And we found that throughout the historical data that the uh, top flood events were all associated with these high vapour transport events these of atmospheric rivers. So over time we've been moving for large scale course diagnostics to more finely graded data to actually understanding how water vapour is moving uh, in the atmosphere. So we've been really very much working on trying to connect the process cascade, which was the, the first diagram that I showed. So trying to understand how ocean variability, and these are some data plotted up here for sea surface temperatures in the North Atlantic, which we linked to drought in, in Europe, and for the first time identified what's called this horseshoe pattern in sea surface temperatures of cold sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic being associated with droughts uh, uh, in the UK, to the transport of heat and moisture over the landmass through a sort of atmospheric bridge, but being modified very much by its interaction with the land surface. So here we can see these data plotted again for, for Europe showing precipitation variability with much higher amounts over Scandinavia uh, linked to the Norwegian mountains, but then this input of water then interacts with catchment properties. And here what we've got are uh, different uh, classes of, of drought across the UK, which show the longest droughts being associated with the most permeable geologies in the south and east, and the, the shortest uh, and but more frequent droughts occurring in much more responsive catchments located in the north and west. So it's helped us to understand how we go from the ocean through the atmosphere to interacting with the land surface to uh, generate hydrological response. So all of these data that we've been, I've presented so far and we've been working on are based upon sort of observations. They're also based largely on near natural catchments, but we know that we are changing our water cycles quite markedly. And indeed our sort of representations of the water cycle are very much dominated by those which are largely sort of natural. So we undertook an analysis uh, of uh, depictions of the global sort of water cycle and we found that only 15% of those had people in them. You think, well, maybe wh why does that sort of matter? Because that's how we conceptualize, that's how we learn about the water cycle. And indeed, that's how many stakeholders uh, pick up. But we are sort of uh, 
part of this cycle and are sort of influencing the size of, uh, of the and the nature of fluxes and impacting on terms of climate, land cover, and sort of water use on how a hydrological cycle operates. Indeed, when we did this analysis of water cycle diagrams, we only found that 2% included pollution and less than 2% had anything to do with dynamics and climate change. So off the back of uh, this uh, push of the need to consider people in, in the water cycle, we have a in press uh, a um, commentary piece in hydrological processes on the sort of water cr crisis, which picks up the role of, sort of human interference on land, climate, and the use of green gray uh, and blue water, how that impacts upon the water cycle and what that means for society, for ecosystems and for hyd hyd and the feedback for what it means in terms of hydrology. So as well as looking at historical sort of observational data, we've also been working on looking at uh, future projections of hydrological response. So we worked as part of a uh, large sort of international sort of multi-model ensemble sort of experiment where we had data where a range of uh, climate models were run. These are all then range run through a range of hydrological models. And then we looked at uh, how, uh, in this case, runoff would change. And what we can see, uh, looking out to uh, 2100 for these projections, is that in terms of the, f uh, the frequency of high flow days, they were going to increase uh, into the future and particularly increase at uh, northern latitudes in sub-Saharan Africa. And there was also going to be a, an increase largely in the uh, frequency of low flow days and there were clear sort of hot spots uh, in terms of where those changes are going to occur. What's very interesting in the context of what we do for the in, uh, International Hydrology Program of UNESCO is these red areas, of the hot spots of change, are also many often those areas which have uh, societies and communities which have the least capacity to adapt to these changes so the two things uh, overlap so we some of this research was about trying to understand the nature of change out to 2100 but what we were very much interested in was what are, why you know how uncertain are these estimates and linked to this what are the sources of uncertainty so we looked at the, the sources of uncertainty using a very simple sort of ANOVA based method to consider where they were associated with the uh, uh, global climate models, or which hydrological model we ran uh, the, the climate models through. And what you can see here is that for many areas of the globe, which climate model you pick is important. But there are many areas, particularly those which might have the greatest water insecurity in terms of droughts into the future, where it is the hydrological model, which hydrological model you use, which is the greatest source of uncertainty for projections. And just to illustrate that a bit more, what we've got plotted up here is uh, as, uh, as rows, we have uh, different hydrological models. Yep. And as columns, we have different climatic zones. And then within each of these uh, plots, we have the uh, year from January to January. And the different colored lines represent uh, different climate model runs. So we take the climate models and run them through different hydrological models. And what you can see quite s starkly here, particularly if you look at the arid region and we look at the polar region, is that actually within the individual models, the climate models are all much more similar. And the greatest difference is between the hydrological model that you use. And this really pushed home the message that you perhaps would think, yes, as a hydrologist, you would say this, is that probably the greatest difference is a result of our representation of the terrestrial hydrological water cycle. Uh, and really, this is much more important than perhaps previously considered in terms of thinking about how people experience the impacts of climate change to the water cycle in terms of the projections is, you know, which hydrological model you use uh, really produces quite, difference, quite big differences in the response and do we represent the water cycle processes properly. The reason why we get such great differences between these models in terms of the sort of polar regions is part of the way they deal with sort of frozen water storage. And again, here in some of the arid environments, it's how groundwater stores are represented. Um, so sticking on the theme of uh, large-scale hydrology, we've just started a new project I want to make a quick advert for, focusing particularly on groundwater drought across Europe, as part of the Groundwater Dr Drought Initiative, uh, which you'd be very much sort of welcome to have your input in uh, and thoughts upon. It's just uh, very recently kicked off. Right, I'd now like to move from sort of water quantity to think about water quality, and specifically to look at uh, river temperature, river temperature dynamics. 
So this is the, the element of uh, water in a changing uh, world, you know, the, the too hot element. Yeah. So as you're probably well aware, and this is a, an example sort of drawn uh, from uh, New Brunswick, uh, it was the most recent Canadian good photograph that I could sort of find, that often high temperature extremes are associated with fish kills yeah, as a result of warm temperatures, low dissolved oxygen, and often uh, toxic algal blooms. So high river temperatures can be sort of lethal for uh, fish, which, is, which are economically important. But they can also uh, have impacts upon uh, socioeconomic activity. So in summer 2013, across Europe, there was real concerns about being able to uh, take in water at an appropriate temperature for cooling for uh, nuclear power stations. And also, what perhaps which caused more, more gas was the ability to discharge uh, heated effluent water from whiskey distilleries in Scotland was almost banned, which might have had a, a significant impact upon people's moods. But what we can see is that river temperatures are are, are, are have, have really changed, if we look at these historical data, over the last few decades, by about a degree uh, per, per decade. So this has really sort of focused people's thinking on how will river temperatures change into the future, given how they've, they've changed uh, over the past. Yeah. And thoughts have been moving towards what sort of mitigation adaptation strategies can we develop. So last summer, wor our work, uh, which is, as you'll see, is largely based in Scotland, got really quite significant media attention. It was very warm uh, in, in the UK. So we had uh, um, significant worries about uh, river temperatures across Scotland. And some of our field sites located on the border between England and Wales actually uh, uh, dried out and were dewatered. So there was a real focusing uh, of people's minds uh, beyond the uh, scientific community on the importance of uh, stream temperature and its impacts upon uh, ecosystems and on socioeconomic activity. So within this area, we're trying to address two fundamental questions. The first of which is, how do climate, river basin properties, and hydrology interact to create thermal heterogeneity across a range of scales? And secondly, how do we put research into practice to reduce high water temperature extremes and generate benefits for ecosystems and for society? So what I want you to go away uh, thinking after this sort of element of the talk is that river temperature is a hydrological problem. If we don't understand the hydrology, we can't understand how river temperature changes. Many sort of practitioners will suggest if we get air temperature projections right, we can probably estimate uh, river temperature. But the, the, the answer is you cannot. You need to understand the hydrological processes as well. So much of our work, and I'll start at the small scale, has been understanding this uh, fundamental energy exchange processes by which streams heat up and cool down. So streams gain uh, energy from radiation from the sun, from long wave radiation re-rated back to space. And heat is, is generated when we have uh, water condensing on cold uh, or icy sort of water surfaces. We can also have heat being generated by frictional flow around the bed and banks and by chemical and biological processes, although the last are very difficult to measure and therefore regarded as negligible. We have heat lost from uh, river systems by shortwave radiation, solar radiation being reflected back to space from the surface, long wave being emitted at the stream surface temperature, but the largest heat loss from rivers is the result of evaporation uh, from the free water surface. But unlike the work I'd done previously on, on s snow and, and glaciers, which was often solving one-dimensional energy balance problems, we have the fact that rivers flow. So we have uh, advective transport occurring as well. We have water flowing in and out. And I should have said, we can also have heat being gained or lost by sensible heating. So from a warm atmosphere uh, to a cooler stream for heat gain or, or being lost from a warmer stream to a cooler atmosphere and we can have heat transfers occurring at the, the stream bed in relation to particularly groundwater, surface water uh, interactions. Our motivation for this work was, uh, in terms of the detailed hydrometeorological uh, research, was to understand the potential of riparian forests to act as a climate change adaptation strategy. So there's lots of uh, fisheries, uh, land, and water management sort of organizations suggesting if we have forest the riparian zone, this will shade streams and it will gain benefits in, in terms of avoiding high temperatures which are damaging to aquatic organisms. But before we did this work, which was largely on uh, regeneration of semi-natural forest uh, in, in Scotland, most of the research had been done in North America on commercial plantations, largely done for relatively short periods of time and largely done during the summer. 
So we were interested to undertake detailed hydro hydrometeorological research to understand what are the differences in terms of heat exchange processes driving river temperature dynamics between open moorland streams and those covered with semi-natural forest. So what we can see here is uh, data plotted up over a diurnal cycle for the summer and for the winter. And as you can see uh, from the summer plot, as we move into the forest, we have a dampening and a lagging of the stream temperature response. So the temperatures are cooler and the peaks occur later in the day. And when we look at the uh, panel on the right hand side, we can see that these differences between uh, or the, the effects of forest are much greater in uh, the summer than they are during the winter. And we wanted to understand what the reason behind this was. So we looked at the sort of fundamental energy exchange processes. Uh, and I just want to pick out this radiative exchanges here. So what I've got plotted up in the blue here is, uh, in the red here, is the uh, amount of shortwave radiation for the open site, and in the blue for the forested site. And we can see here the result of riparian shading or, or blocking by the trees of the, the energy from the sun being much reduced in summer by 75%, but still being reduced by about 60% uh, during the winter. What was also notable was that in terms of the amount of long wave radiation, we and long wave radiation is, is lost from the stream at the surface temperature, we found that long wave loss for the uh, site which had uh, the forest, which is plotted up in the green here, was less than for the uh, open sort of moorland site plotted up in the orange. And this was a result of the, uh, the overhanging canopy sort of re-radiating heat uh, from the leaves back towards the stream and meaning the amount of net long wave radiation loss was less. As a consequence, we have greater variability in radiative exchanges uh, over, the, over the year for the moorland than the, the uh, forested site. Yeah. So, and as a consequence, the stream temperature variability being much greater at the moorlands, both in terms of summer extremes and winter troughs uh, than uh, for the site covered in forest. So this research was comparing semi-natural woodland with open moorland. We did some work uh, in the west coast of Scotland, uh, which has quite a different, more sort of much more maritime climate than those data I just presented, which were the Cairngorms in this dry east. And what was really noticeable here is we compared commercial coniferous plantation with semi-natural woodland with open grassland. Yeah? And here this commercial plantation is Sitka spruce planted in 1975. And what you can note is that not all trees have the same effect. That actually the biggest differences in terms of, and this, these plots are for total energy exchange, uh, there's the greatest differences between the commercial plantation, so this very dense planting, and the other two sites. And actually the open grassland and the, and the semi-natural woodland are much more similar. So the take-home message from this slide is planting trees may act as a climate change adaptation strategy, but it depends what type of trees you plant. So we used uh, this energy balance-based work looking at uh, how streams heat up and, and cool down in terms of the processes to build uh, some models looking at longitudinal gradients of stream temperature as we move into forested reach reaches using a uh, Lagrangian particle tracking model. So what this model does is it solves the energy balance for the stream uh, all the way down the river uh, network. Uh, and it characterized the amount of, sort of riparian cover using hemispheric fisheye photographs, which gave us a sky view factor and gave us a sort of canopy density. So what we did is we ran the model, tracked particles as they moved down here, into this increasingly dense uh, forest canopy. What you can see here for this plot, which is distance downstream from the uh, upland open section into the forested section, is that stream temperatures appeared to cool by about 2 to 2.5 degrees over about a kilometre. But when we actually looked at the, the processes behind the model, we saw that although temperatures are 2.5 degrees cooler here, actually what we found is this was water that had originated at the top of the reach during the night and had moved down through the forest and, and actually hadn't cooled, it just hadn't got any hotter. So the takeaway message from this is trees can stop the, the stream certainly over only a kilometre reach from adding uh, much more heat, but actually you need to think about the headwater conditions and if you're deforest them, planting riparian forest for the down may have uh, uh, less impact. We then went on to do further modelling in terms of uh, looking at sensitivity analysis to uh, three sort of aspects. We looked at uh, simulated um, stream temperature response in relation to changes in uh, forest cover uh, from 90% forest cover 
all the way through to, uh, to, to very uh, sparse 10% uh, forest cover. And we also looked at what the effect of ch channel orientation was. So we took these real sort of observations of riparian cover and then spanned the river network around in such a way to, to change its orientation uh, from right through 180 degrees. We also looked at the rates at which water sort of moved through the reaches in terms of both high and low velocity scenarios to understand the role of, um, of hydraulics as well. And the outcomes of this research were quite s surprising. What we could see is where we had very sort of sparse canopy density, basically all, all the models, depending on channel orientation, were the same. And when we had very dense forest canopies, we didn't find much difference. But we found between 60 and 30 percent uh, of canopy density, the, the channel orientation was a really, really important factor in influencing the amount of radiation reaching the, s the stream. Yeah? Yeah, so depending on how the stream was shaded, uh, depending on which bank or where the bank was that had the trees on, could really influence the amount of radiation getting to the stream. So it showed that channel and tori orientation was really important. So, uh, so the take home message from that is yes, planting trees is important, but you could plant it tactically in, in particular locations in terms of the channel orientations for maximum benefit. We also found that hydraulic retention time was very, very important. Uh, in terms of the, the slower flow velocities al allowing more time for heat to accumulate. So that was uh, one dimensional modeling, but we've also done work uh, using sort of uh, uh, 2D sort of analyses or, or of uh, river temperature dynamics. And here we're so working at a site in uh, northern Sweden using uh, the, the Delft uh, 3D sort of model to model stream temperature uh, over time. So what you can see here is the stream temperature is changing, and, uh, and the, I think it's not come out so well, but you can also get a clock of, the, of the, the times of day that this was happening. So what's really interesting from these data is that this site is located in uh, northern Sweden, and located up here is a glacier. So what happens over the day is that initially the uh, stream temperatures sort of heat up, but then as the snow and glaciers start to melt, they release cold meltwater, which results in the water temperatures dropping so later in the day. And the takeaway message from this is uh, uh, takeaway messages from this are twofold. One, connectivity is really important in terms of uh, stream temperature response, but also stream temperature is a hydrological problem because we need to think about where the waters come from and how much heat uh, is added to as it passes through the, the fluvial system. So we've tried to, uh, in a recent project, pull together greater information about spatial heterogeneity in river and stream temperatures by using drone base of observations, coupling that with some of the high resolution uh, hydrometeorological studies that we've done, and also using landscape metrics uh, to consider the key controls on uh, water temperature and to pull them all together in some process-based modeling uh, to improve our knowledge. So we thought this was a, a, a great idea and, uh, and sort of forged ahead as part of this European Union funded project. So we thought that drone-based thermal imagery might be a, a really good way to sort of understand sort of spatial heterogeneity in river temperature. However, we find out that um, what we've got plotted up here is uh, distance on, uh, on the y-axis and temperature uh, on, on, on the, 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 the y-axis. And the blue dots are observations made in the stream using temperature data loggers. And the black line is the uh, temperature taken from the drone. And what you can see is that uh, the drone-based imagery absolutely isn't correct, or it's, or it's not correct much of the time. We find that this was due to both issues with the camera, but also how the surrounding environment was influencing uh, the imagery. So thermal imagery, uh, we find, was absolutely wrong, but we did find was relatively correct. So within each of the scenes, uh, this example so was thermal image here, the relative values were about right, but the absolute values were no, were, were no good, so not so suitable for looking at longitudinal patterns. We've since then been working on uh, developing some methods to de-drift uh, the, the scenes that we've got and correct uh, the images. What we did find from drone-based surveys that was very useful was the possibility of using structure from motion to reconstruct tree heights uh, to build into our river temperature models. So ground-based surveys of tree heights and using uh, LIDAR are s generally uh, s quite expensive. So we used a uh, structure for motion when we fly a, a drone with an optical camera and film uh, the scenes uh, as we go. And these are some data for a site 
in the northeast of, of Scotland. And what you get from uh, the Structural Motion Survey is a, uh, a, a, a imagery for, this is the optical image for, for the site, is a, uh, is a, a digital s surface model, a, a bare surface model, where because the, the, the uh, drone as it flies obliquely can pick up this ground surface. And from differencing the two, you can get a, uh, a tree height uh, model. And, and, and what we were able to do with this was plug this into uh, our numerical model of, of river temperature to predict, um, uh, to, to predict the, the, the water temperatures. So what we've got plotted up here uh, uh, in these three tiles are data for automatic weather stations at three locations downstream. In the blue, we've got the observations. In the green, we've got this a model based upon trees from structural motion. And just really simply for the purpose of this presentation, we've got a model which has no trees in it. And what we can see as we move downstream sort of overall is that uh, the stream, stream temperatures from structural motion model show a reduction as a result of moving into a riparian forest. It's the same region we did the Lagrangian modeling on uh, over, a, over a, 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 in this case, a, a two kilometer stretch. The stream temperature reduced by about one and a half degrees. And what we can see from the modeling is that by building in the structural motions of imagery for the tree heights, we get a much closer fit to uh, what the temperature observations uh, are. We then so moved from working at uh, river catchment scales, or, or in parallel to this, to looking at uh, river temperature over so much larger so spatial scales. And we, in this case, looked at river temperature variability across uh, England and Wales. These data were drawn from uh, something called the Environment Agency's uh, Surface Water Temperature Archive. And we were able to identify different regions of England and Wales which had different thermal response from those which were generally cooler to those that were, were warmer with both high and low seasonality. What was interesting is when we plotted these uh, river temperature magnitude classes against air temperature, they didn't match, which suggested that catchment properties were really important. So we, we looked at uh, the sensitivity of water temperature to air temperature using a, a sensitivity index based upon conditional probability. Uh, and all you need to know from this plot is that towards the bottom is uh, increasing sensitivity values towards zero and, and higher values are less sensitive. So we found that the least sensitive locations were associated with more permeable geologies, uh, also with uh, not just permeable geology, but uh, smaller catchment areas, so less time for sort of atmospheric exposure. And we found that catchment elevation was important and we found that we had warmer and decreased seasonality as we, we moved to lower elevations as a result of greater groundwater contributions and buffering. So from these data, which were taken from an opportunistic sort of network, we found that the climatic sensitivity of river temperature is very much modified by river basin properties, uh, suggesting the key importance of hydrological processes. So those data that we used for England and Wales were not ideal in the sense that they were taken from opportunistic monitoring of water quality. So we worked to develop with Scottish Government a river temperature network for the whole of Scotland uh, using the, the concept of Latin squares, which allowed us to cover the full sort of environmental range of, sort of landscapes uh, for the country. And the details of that are published in a, in a paper in uh, uh, hydrological research. What we then did was, having identified the, the key sites in terms of designing the network, we worked with the Scottish Government to uh, come up with a protocol for uh, deploying the loggers, but involved uh, local sort of river trusts and boards as part of a participatory monitoring activity to actually deploy the loggers, to download them, and to send the data back. Some people sort of refer to this maybe as citizen science, but actually I would rather call it sort of participatory monitoring in the sense that there's still a really central role to be played here in terms of involving sort of Scottish Government scientists in terms of the data quality control and also the storage and analysis of data. So having developed this network, we had put out 223 loggers, which are now collected about 40 million sort of observations. Uh, and I should say, these data, as you'll s see on a s later slide, uh, are of practical importance in terms of pr then feeding into uh, grant applications for planting of riparian trees by local stakeholders uh, uh, and, and land owners. So we use these observations to build statistical models of river temperature response across uh, networks. And this is an example taken from the River Spey, which shows uh, river temperature uh, predictions based upon landscape properties across the whole of the river basin, 
and shows the standard error of less than half a degree. These models were based upon uh, s uh, generalized linear models, but include something called a river network smoother, which describes the s geostatistical variability uh, in temperature across the catchment. And in terms of key predictive variables from a, a partial area, a partial effects model uh, uh, for summer temperatures, we find that the key controls beyond the river network structure were river elevation, which is a surrogate for climate, riparian woodland, linked to riparian shading and gradient, which relates to hydraulic retention time. We then uh, developed a, a slightly different model, which is a, a space-time model, to be able to predict uh, maximum summer temperature across the whole of Scotland. So going from those individual river basins and having covered the range of environmental conditions across the country to predict river temperature for the, the, the whole nation. And these models included air temperatures as a dynamic model, location, but also landscape properties, including the effects of riparian woodlands. We use these data to make predictions of the space-time variability uh, in, uh, in, in, in river temperature, and notably, the climatic sensitivity. And what was really notable were some of the predicted temperatures for areas which we didn't have so much data for here uh, in the north uh, and appear to be very, very sensitive to change. We then have pulled through these maps uh, and provided them as tools to fisheries and river management sort of organisations. So working with Scottish Government, we have used the, the observations and, and the data to provide advice, pamphlets, but most remarkably perhaps, all of these data are now available on an interactive uh, website uh, which you can go in and look at river temperatures across the whole of Scotland as models and landowners can then pull out information for individual river basins to put into sort of plan, uh, planning applications uh, for repair and forestry and other sort of management uh, techniques. So what I wanted to really illustrate here was going from doing scientific research through to providing information and advice that's of direct sort of practical relevance. So lastly, I just wanted to uh, uh, highlight some of the research we've been doing on snow and glacier hydrology. And we're going to the, uh, going to the cold water lab tomorrow, so this is really just a very, very short prelude for some of the, 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 the work we've been doing in this space. So probably uh, for a couple of decades, we've been working on, the, uh, on snow and, and ice-covered basins. And snow and ice-covered environments are demonstrably some of the most sensitive to its environmental change because a very strong coupling between large-scale atmospheric circulation, the local climate, the energy and mass exchanges, that then influences how meltwater is generated and how it runs through glaciers. And then within the wider river basin context, that influences stream flow contributions from snow, glaciers and groundwater, which influences physical chemical habitat and in turn, uh, ecological response. So we just had a paper published in the last few weeks uh, based upon uh, a, a study site uh, in Iceland. I just wanted to highlight here the work we've been doing, which has been looking at runoff variability, but not just in terms of, sort of daily flows, but looking at different runoff signatures, different ways to characterize runoff. And we've also been looking at the uncertainty. So what I've got plotted up here is how the, uh, d the stream flow response will evolve over time. But I don't want really to sort of, uh, you to focus on the details, but just to get across the message that we found that different hydrological signatures uh, had different sources of uncertainty. So we found for the, the, s the signatures associated with high flows, they were very much more influenced by uh, uh, the climate drivers, and those associated with low flows were very much more associated with the, the modeling of how water flowed through uh, the glacial system. So we've been doing work on how this hydrological cycle is changing in snow and ice-covered environments, and we fed this into uh, what we've been doing on the impact upon sort of ecosystem services, and we had a, a review published a couple of years ago now in, in PNAS that pulled out that glaciers and, and glacier shrinkage is much more uh, of an impact than, than changes in sea level rise, but has influences upon uh, all sorts of aspects of, of mountain and high latitude environments. We've been working in, in high latitude environments for some time now with local communities uh, trying to understand how the, the changing hydrology is impacting upon sort of ecosystem services. Uh, and here we've been adopting sort of participatory monitoring approaches, including sort of local communities, to use low-cost wireless sensor networks to collect data, but also to involve people, not just in the collection of information, but to decentralize the processing and decision-making around uh, barren water and high mountain environments and embedding sort of indigenous knowledge. And by doing this, we've been able to work towards strategies of what we call sort of uh, actionable knowledge and to, to work towards more adaptive governance approaches. So we're, looking, we're working with local communities here to say we can provide 
hydrological information, combine it with the local knowledge to make better decisions about ecosystem services, ecosystem services provision, which may help uh, in the context of poverty alleviation. And in, in the context of wireless sensor networks, just had a, a, a review published in the last uh, couple of weeks, which looks at the prospects for low-cost wireless sensor networks uh, into the future. We've been using s similar participation monitoring approaches for not just uh, hydrological ecosystem services, but also for looking at disaster resilience, a current project uh, under the Science for Humanity and Emergencies and Resilience program uh, in Nepal, looking at uh, how we can use uh, participatory monitoring with local communities and indigenous knowledge to better uh, forecast hydrologically induced uh, floods and landslides. And lastly, in terms of high mountain snow and glacier work, We've just begun a project uh, very close to Machu Picchu working on water security and climate change in Peru and asking the question, as sort of glaciers uh, in the Andes shrink, can some of the high altitude wetlands serve this, the uh, storage and release function that the frozen water uh, does uh, now? So to conclude with a few sort of final thoughts, I hope in this presentation I've been able to sort of communicate the understanding how water and environment response to climate and other drivers of change remains a really significant scientific challenge, but also that it's practically important because we have too much, too little, or water that's too hot has impacts upon aquatic ecosystems and people. But there's still more to do in terms of those three key challenge areas about quantifying changes in hydrological fluxes and stores, unraveling the drivers, and also improving our geographical and conceptual understanding. If we can do this, we should be able to uh, generate knowledge to help reduce uncertainty in our projections, to link to more sustainable water and adaptation strategies. In all of the things I've presented, I think, I hope we've got across the fact that terrestrial hydrology is really important, that the hydrological s uh, response is not some nonlinear transfer function of the climate system. We have to understand the hydrological processes themselves and how they vary across space and time. And lastly, that interdisciplinary interactions and all of these projects have been absolutely vital. Uh, and on that note, I will close uh, and uh, offer you the opportunity to engage, interact, collaborate uh, in the work we're doing as part of the UNESCO Chair in Water Sciences at the University of Birmingham. Thank you. Thanks very much, David, for the stimulating talk. Yeah, we have time for questions. Uh, th thank you, David. It's a very interesting talk and really enjoy the uh, material and the approach uh, to it. The water temperatures is something that uh, there's research occurring in global water futures. There's some modeling here, but the process studies I don't think generally have occurred here. But your approach is, uh, seems, seems very uh, suitable. Uh, in dealing with forest canopies, have you run into situations where the canopy heats up above the air temperature or cools off below the air temperature? And if you have, uh, have you had to deal with it or have you dealt with it? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, so we're working at 57 degrees north uh, in the Cairngorms for some of the detailed process studies. So we have use of IR thermometers to measure sort of canopy uh, temperature, but it's not something we've had continuous data on. Uh, and in winter, yes, we found they're, they're warmer than the, the, the surroundings of air, but uh, n not, not so much. Uh, we've not actually had observations in summer to know the answer to that question, but it's, it's a really good question to ask. Yeah, thanks for the talk, David, and I think you've encouraged a lot of students with your last slides because it looks like there's still lots of work to do. Um, I'm, th I'm thinking about land surface models, GCM, RCM, some of our land surface hydrology systems, which resolve the energy budget as well, right? I mean, that's part of it. Yeah. Are you, are, are people using those types of models to actually try to look at stream temperature as well? Are you aware of that kind of work? Yeah, so um, I am aware of that type of work and that's something we're, we're hoping to s take forward. So some, some colleagues at the University of Utrecht have started that, Nico Wanders and others using large scale physically based models. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, it's definitely an avenue for, for further research. I mean, one of the issues really with that and th the reason for talking about collaboration with NICO in that space is the observational data sets to be able to sort of calibrate and, and validate those models is, is, is really the issue. I mean, with uh, a lot of water temperature studies, uh, apart from a few sort of uh, 
regionally targeted bespoke studies, much of those data are from opportunistic water quality sort of monitoring, and we find can be sort of very inconsistent because they're taken at different times of day, they're taken using sort of different uh, protocols for approaches, so trying to look at them over larger sort of spatial domains becomes a very challenging thing to do. I have a question for you, David. Uh, so on your global scale modeling work, where you showed model uncertainty is a big one compared to even probably GCM uncertainty. I wonder if you could illumine, elaborate more on the differences of the models that you've used there. And assume you, uh, those models cannot be calibrated or typically th th those are out of the shelves applications of these models or, yeah, I've yeah. never worked with those, I wonder. Yeah. So there's, there's a range of, of different models which are run by the, the groups that are experts within those and then they're assimilated as part of the, the ISMIPS model into comparison project. But what's really notable is what I said during the presentation is how the differences are really how they deal with uh, the stores and how they sort of interact with, within the models in terms of uh, particularly the sort of long residence time stores of groundwater and uh, snow and, and glacier cover. Uh, and they're very, very different between uh, the, the different models. And of course, there's a, cause they're global models. So there's not a sort of one size fits all answer to this, but they've been developed and tuned for sort of different parts of the world. So when you try and apply them on the global scale, they're better and worse in, in, in different locations. But it, I think really what it shows is some of the sort of storages are not sort of well represented. So although you may get the sort of inputs right, that, that sort of storage and release element between the different models can, can vary differently depending upon uh, things like the, the, the model structure, the way they're represented in the landscape. Yeah, and what what we also had, and I didn't show, was that we had sort of those were sort of offline models where the climate models were, were were input to the hydrological models, but then the sort of dynamics of land surface models they plot completely differently uh, in a completely different space from from the ones I showed on on the slide a moment ago. Yeah, right. So just a quick follow up. So groundwater representation in, in those models could be quite different as well yeah. as reservoir operation. Absolutely. Yeah, yes, and I, the human impact side is also variable between the different models. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, on that note, we're at a very good point to close this session. It's almost 4.30. So please join me in thanking uh, David for coming here. But just before that, so make sure the next week we're going to have Bridget Scan uh, Scanlon from University of Texas, Austin at the same place, same time. You'll make sure to be there as well. So thank you very much, David. I hope you enjoy the rest of your visit here and also your visit to Coldwater Lab tomorrow in Canmore. Thanks, man. Thanks so much.